Pursuant to Committee Rule 9G, the witnesses will please stand and raise the right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, I do. I do. Let the record show that the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. We appreciate you being here today and look forward to your testimony. Let me remind the witnesses that we have read your written statements, and they will appear in full in the hearing record. Please press the button on your microphone in front of you so that it's on and the members can hear you. I recognize Mr. Ziegler to please begin his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Comer, Chairman Smith, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Raskin, and members of the committee. Today, I, I, I sit here before you not as a hero or, or a victim, but as a whistleblower compelled to disclose the truth. That said, in coming forward, I believe I'm risking my career, my reputation, and my casework outside of the investigation we are here to discuss. I ultimately made the decision to come forward after what I believe were multiple attempts at blowing the whistle in the Internal Revenue Service, at the Internal Revenue Service. No one should be above the law, regardless of your political affiliation. I humbly view my role here today as providing the facts as I best understood them and to let Congress and the administration and the public consider those facts and determine the best path forward. I recognize why I was present at the start of this investigation and was closely involved with the investigation for roughly five years. I'm just a part of the story. Others, including my colleague and supervisor Gary Shapley, who is here with me today, have their own views and understandings of what took place during this investigation. I've been an agent with the IRS since 2010. In 2007, I received my undergraduate degree from Ohio University, my MBA from John Carroll University. Prior to starting my career at the IRS, I worked at Ernst & Young, Ernst & Young as an external auditor. Throughout my career with the IRS, I have worked a variety of successful criminal tax and money, money laundering investigations. In 2018, I transitioned to being, a, to being a part of the International Tax and Financial Crimes Group out of the Washington, D.C. field office. I was the lead IRS case agent on the Hunter Biden investigation. I've recently discovered that people are saying that I must be more credible because I'm a Democrat who happens to be married to a man. I'm no more credible than this man sitting next to me due to my, actual, due to my sexual orientation or my political beliefs. The truth is, my credibility comes today from my job experience with the IRS and my intimate knowledge of the agency's standard and procedures. I was raised and have always strived to do what is right. Although I do have my supporters, others have said that I am a traitor to the Democratic Party and that I am causing more division in our society. I implore you to consider that if you were in my position with the facts as I have stated them, ask yourself if you would be doing the exact same thing. I hope that I am an example to other LGBTQ people out there who are questioning doing the right thing at the potential cost of themselves and others. We should always do the right thing, no matter how painful the process might be. I kind of equate this to the experience and feelings I encountered when coming out. It was honestly one of the hardest things I ever had to go through. I contemplated scenarios that would have been highly regrettable, but I did what is right and I'm, standing in, or I'm sitting here in front of you today. I would first like to take a minute to thank some people for their unfettered help and support. First off, God, for giving me the strength and courage to get through this process. My husband, who has been my rock, has put up with me, my stress, and has had to deal with, with his personal information being out there. My attorney, Dean Zerby, who has agreed to represent me through this matter pro bono and someone who has provided me so much help and guidance. My colleagues from the Hunter Biden investigation. The work that was done on this case was, is tremendous, but seems to be overshadowed by what is happening here today. And I just want to say to the investigative team that I am thankful for having worked with you. I also want to thank my family and friends back home in Northeast Ohio and Georgia. I don't live in the DC area. I had to fly here and have had to pay out of pocket for all my travel related expenses in being a whistleblower. On that note, I would like to make another statement that I have not accepted a single payment from anyone for being a whistleblower. First, well, so Mr. Chairman, while I have my written statement as well as my testimony before the Ways and Means Committee, I would like to touch on briefly seven specific matters. First, in a recent letter to Congress, Mr. Weiss stated that he had been granted ultimate authority over this matter, 
but then later stated in the same letter that his charging authority is geographically limited and that he would need a President Biden appointed U.S. attorney to partner with him in charging the case. Mr. Weiss stated that he, is, he was making all decisions necessary to preserve the integrity of the prosecution consistent with federal law, the principles of federal prosecution, and departmental regulations. In the, internal, in the criminal tax manual, chapter 10, found on the DOJ website, Tax Division Policy states that cases involving indiv individuals who fail to file tax returns or pay a tax, but who also commit acts of evasion or obstruction should be charged as felonies to avoid an equitable treatment. In early August of 2022, federal prosecutors from the Department of Justice Tax Division drafted a 99-page memorandum. In, in so, they were recommending for approval felony and misdemeanor charges for the 2017, 18, and 19 tax years. That did not happen here, and I am not sure why. And as, to the special and, and as the special agent on this case, I thought the felony charges were well supported. When considering the elements of felony tax case, under the criminal code, there are two key considerations, willfulness and tax due and owing. In the criminal context, willfulness is, a, is defined as voluntary, intentional violation of a known legal duty. The tax loss is the monetary loss to the government. In 2020, in early 2020, Hunter, Biden unfile, or Hunter Biden's unfiled and delinquent tax returns were being prepared, which included his 2018 tax return. During the 2020 time period, by Hunter Biden's own account, he was sober, newly married, and writing his memoir. Hunter Biden's accountants requested that he sign a representation letter stating that all the deductions were for business purposes and were being reported appropriately. Statements Hunter Biden made in his book completely contradicted what he was deducting as business deductions on his 2018 return. While writing his memoir, Hunter stated, I holed up inside the chateau for the first six weeks and learned how to cook crack. Hunter Biden allegedly falsely claimed business deductions for, chat, for payments made to the Chateau Marmont, a hotel room for his supposed drug dealer, sex club memberships, falsely referenced on the wire as a golf membership, hotels he was blacklisted from, and a Columbia University tuition payment for his adult daughter. All of these items were used to support willfulness, the willfulness element for felony tax evasion, these false deductions claimed by Hunter Biden caused a false return to be prepared that underreported his total income by approximately $267,000 and a loss to the U.S. Treasury of $106,000. Second, with respect to the 2014 tax year, Hunter Biden did not report any of the money he earned from Burisma for the 2014 tax year, which would have, which would have been a tax loss to the government of $124,000. According to my previous testimony, Hunter Biden did not report this income to the IRS or pay tax on the source of income. There is nothing that I see in the public documents as to the Department of Justice's action against Hunter Biden that indicate that Hunter Biden will be required to pay tax on this Burisma income from 2014 or amend his 2014 tax return. I would like to note that the plea agreement, when released, may provide a, great, a greater understanding. Third, I would like to make clear that the charging document for the District of Delaware, Hunter Biden was charged with failure to timely pay his taxes for 2017 and 18 in excess of $100,000 for each tax year. On Hunter Biden's 2017 and 18 tax returns, Hunter reported taxes owed of, of approximately $581,000 and $620,000 respectfully. This tax amount in 2018 would not have included the alleged additional tax due and owing from the filed false return of $106,000. Thus, as I read the pub public documents as the Department of Justice action against Hunter Biden, there is nothing that indicates Hunter Biden will be required to amend his false tax return for 2018. A false tax return that includes proper deductions, improper deductions for prostitutes, sex clubs, and his, and his adult children's tuition. Again, perhaps when the plea agreement is released, it may provide us with a greater understanding. Fourth, the decision to bring felony counts against Hunter Biden was agreed to by both prosecutors and investigators. In the fall of 2021, I met with prosecutors assigned to the case, and we all agreed and decided which charges we are going to recommend 
to, in the prosecution report, which included felony counts related to 2014 and 18. In March of 2022, the prosecutors requested discovery from the investigative team and presented the case to the DC US Attorney's Office. In later meetings in early August of 2022, the assigned prosecutors, all four attorneys, agreed to recommend felony and misdemeanor charges for the 2017, 18, and 19 tax years, insofar as the Department of Justice Tax Division attorney sent an email about the process of bringing charges to include felony and misdemeanor tax charges in two separate districts, Delaware and Los Angeles. Less than a month later, Gary Shapley and I met with Mr. Weiss. He stated that he agreed with us regarding the 2014 and 2015 tax year misdemeanor and felony charges, but that this could somehow affect the later year misdemeanor and felony charges that he conveyed were stronger. Despite these facts, the plea deal that is, being dis that is being discussed occurred. To this day, I do not have a reason why that occurred. From my perspective, this might not have been problematic had the investigation been handled in the ordinary course. Fifth, as I had previously testified and is contained in my written testimony, I have outlined for you some instances in which assigned prosecutors did not appear to follow the normal investigative process so walk the investigation and put, play, put in place unnecessary approvals and roadblocks from effectively and, if, in, and efficiently investigating the case. A number of times we were not able to follow the facts. I am happy to respond to questions concerning these instances. Sixth, I will also note that while the impression has been conveyed by the U.S. Attorney in Delaware that he has similar powers to that of a special counsel in this case, free reign to do as needed, that was not the case. It appeared to me, based on what I experienced, that the U.S. Attorney in Delaware in our investigation was constantly hamstrung, limited, and marginalized by DOJ officials as well as other U.S. attorneys. I still think that a special counsel is necessary for this investigation um, to further handle ancillary investigations that are spun off and relate to Hunter Biden but may not have venue in Delaware. I would, lastly, I would like to conclude again by encouraging Congress and the administration to consider establishing an official channel for federal investigators to pull the emergency cord and raise the issue of the appointment or of the appointment of a special counsel for consideration by senior officials. I do not want my colleagues at the IRS, FBI, and other federal law enforcement agencies to go through my frustrating journey, to go through my frustrating journey and that of our team. I believe such a path will strengthen the public's confidence in their institutions and their fair and equal treatment of all Americans under the law. Thank you, and I look forward to the questions.